All right. Hello and welcome to This and That. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Beyer. Hi, Dave. Nice to see you on screen again because I got nice to see, to see you, you in on. person. Yes. Yes. This is a skating lesson. We'll be discussing all things figure skating going on this week. So if you're new here, please subscribe below and smash that like button. Well, Jonathan, we saw each other last night, but how are you doing? What's new? What's happening? Well, you know, I cleaned the kitchen. I cleaned the table. It's as if a fabulous TSL dinner party didn't even happen last night. Didn't Isn't even that happen. crazy? All right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was so good to see you. And La, Blast yeah. from the Past, TSL favorite. Played a game called Quip Smash. People will love, they oh, love games. Jackbox, Jackbox, yeah. So Jackbox, it was like- Jackbox, but it was the Quip thing. Quip we, Stitch, maybe, quip, maybe or something? Lash. Quip Lash. Sounds right, play on words. I, and we I used a lot of only, skating references. I won one out of three. La won two out of three. I think I was the silver medalist in the other two, but- I, you know, I was thrilled just to be competing. You were thrilled just to be there, yes. <laughs> I just felt I made a positive effort, yeah. <laughs> there, were, there were inappropriate things said and I wasn't even the most inappropriate, so. Yeah, so that's a winning day for you, I guess, okay. Um, <laughs> it was something like, what does a, <laughs> the winning comment of the day was laws about like, what does a person at a toll booth say every day? <laughs> and I thought that like, I forgot my Purell was gonna really, yeah, you were a little too real. You were a little too real. It yeah. didn't take it. It wasn't that yeah. funny compared to Laws, which was just- And Suzanne Bonally was making a couple of appearances in the answers. Like this was a winning- I did have a, a great one. Game. I did have a one that killed. So it was something about what's the strangest thing to have on a parking spot close to, I forget how it was worded, but like what's the strangest thing to see in a parking spot, like a custom- and I wrote Brenda Kerrigan. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who reserves the parking spot? Yeah, there were yes. great skating references being yes. made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. Lots of things happening. So, yes. And we tried to get Jonathan to watch the US Gymnastics Classics last night. He was, of course, not really paying attention and also not having it. Just. No, I know. We caught the Simone vault, which was yes. impressive. I just. I do feel like when non-skating fans watch skating mm -hmm. and you're like, it looks great, but sometimes I can't even understand the magnitude of the greatness that she's putting out there because I need more sort of technical knowledge, I think, in order to really appreciate how insane what she's doing is. It's basically like she's Midori Ito and the rest of the field is Lisa Irvin, okay? And Say no more. No shade on Lisa Irvin. That's just the difference of yeah. like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. And like these, these sort of skills that she's putting out are her what? Are they her quad axles? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Constantly. But I need you by me to translate that sort of thing the entire time. <laughs> Jonathan saying the leotards look cheap. No one liked the hair knots. But <laughs> yes, there was a lot of things happening. And earlier yeah. in the day, what you didn't see is that Chelsea Memo made a comeback. And when I do see a live on Sundays, I've subjected everyone to watching Chelsea's weekly updates because okay. she posts them at six. And basically I'm like, like my original blog, it's like what I'm obsessed with, I will make you obsessed with whether you want to be or not, right? Yeah, you're gonna share that passion with everyone. Yes. <laughs> yes. <So> okay. <laughs> I shared her, and I watch it. It's been very interesting because I think I started skating roughly around the time Chelsea was just working out and then she was starting to flip, especially during the pandemic, she was going into the gym and then she was trying things. So it felt like on some level, even though mine is much smaller, but being an adult doing something, an activity again and trying to get in shape, there was, you know, she's very relatable. You know, it's some of these other athletes are not as relatable, though it's still interesting to watch their vlogs. There's something very real about Chelsea and very accessible and she's a mom and she, I don't know, she's got a barn in the back and she puts like a swimming thing. It's just like interesting to watch her and it's not high tech and she's not some media personality. So it's it, very interesting to watch her. It's very real to watch her every week and her ups and downs and she gets okay. frustrated and it was emotional to like watch her to, even though what Chelsea did, she was doing her first competition on vault. She did a vault that's very easy for her, but she will probably add another twist to it in a couple of weeks at the Nationals 
to see her do it, it was like, okay, you got to do it. You got to do it. Come on, go, go, go. Because she's had ankle injuries. She had a bad ankle that lasted months when mine lasted months around the time. So like, just like seeing different things happen to her, you like being on the journey and knowing the backstories, I think is what really invests us into these athletes. Well, and it's like us. you said, where sometimes skating will miss the mark when everything's sunshine and, yes. you know, lollipops or whatever. And you're like actually seeing someone real go through struggles, go through ups and go through downs in the training process. It makes it so much more real and humanizes someone and makes you root for them in a totally different way. And it's, the thing is, when you do put yourself out there, you do get comments. I think that the most of the comments that Chelsea puts out are overwhelmingly um, positive, right? But there are people that I have been a friend that they don't watch her all the time. And they're like, well, because there was a period where Chelsea hurt her ankle. She really wasn't making progress. And they're like, she's just doing this for the likes, or she's just doing this for this. Or because I think it's there was a point in time where it was very unclear what way this comeback was going, which I think happens in probably every comeback when someone gets injured and they're older, you're like, and she's had a career of injuries of a long time, which makes this extra emotional. Mm -hmm. um, she, she looked the best in her life in 2008 and in 2003 and five. So like the years were not like, and in 2004, she probably should have been taken to the Olympic team. And in April, she broke her foot or broke her ankle. <sighs> One of those uh, on a beam disc not at the Olympics in Beijing in 2008, because her she didn't make the Olympics in 04, she only made it as an alternate and they should have taken her anyway. In 08, she broke her ankle in the training at the Olympics and decided to compete anyway and just did one event instead of being like a major player on the team. So right. she has a lot of unfinished business that it's very exciting to see her at least try and she yeah. can herself. So it's very inspiring and then you know, Michaela Skinner has had a lot of success. So I actually think it's a big opportunity for the skaters to do something like this. The only thing is it takes a heck of a lot of time, I'm sure, to be yeah. training. And I mean, Roman Sadovsky has done it a little bit. And, you know, but I think that there, there are opportunities. Obviously we see like Maren Honda and Shoma Uno. We don't understand the language all the time, but their blogs do very well. I think we're seeing Team Two Breeds a start to do this. And I do think that we- Yeah, they seem them. right now, like a lot of skaters go to are these sort of Instagram clips, but I yes. would love something a little bit more in depth. Yeah. Well, I think it's hard because skaters and gymnasts, they're always trying routines. They're trying to perfect them. There's the thing about, are you gonna put out a skill that's maybe not gonna be done well, that's gonna attract judges and attract the wrong kind of attention. That's one of the fears. Mm. Then there's the kind of fear that you could put something out and someone could recalibrate their bar routine. So there's this girl who competed last night named Sunisa Lee, and she will ch show her bar routine and all of these combinations she's putting together. And that's the equivalent of like a team two breeds a quad um, flex, right? Okay. That's from your road. Well, at least I can know what I have to do to adjust my bar routine now. And people didn't like her already and they went after her. <laughs> Of course, okay. no one's going to do that. Like, this is yeah. not news. It I comes mean, with the territory. Edit, yeah. but it's not tasteful, but it makes it kind of fun, right? Like, it makes yeah, it yeah, fun. yeah, exactly. It's a competition at the end of the day. Yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, people were very upset with her, but they were upset with her for other reasons. All of these abusive coaches and things, and people, you know, a lot of these things get. Okay. But yes, I, I would like to watch Keegan Messing's Alaskan Life and like see him training and right on outside and yeah. I think it's kind of the next uh, thing to happen in skating is we need a couple of skaters. The thing with, uh, I think we see with Ignastia where she tried and it wasn't a slam dunk right away and then she kind of pulled back. And the thing with these YouTube channels is it's a, it's a marathon. It is not right. sprint. You got to keep going and build and try right. and get better. Well, and especially for North American skaters at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, as we all know, the the people that only tune in every Olympics still don't really know any of the players mm -hmm. I, anywhere, Canada, the U.S., like any of this. So I feel like the more we get to know personalities, the more like someone like Nathan Chen could really get some momentum going 
-hmm. with sort of this crossover fame if I think the layman got to know him a little bit more. And I think for that fear, it would be like, well, is someone going to see what quads I'm attempting and then try to rearrange their program? But they're going to find out eventually. Of course. I mean, you watch Tom Daly and he does different, you know, six different dives. And based on how they're going, someone could potentially rearrange theirs. And then I think it's right. always the um, thing that it's a distraction, right? right? But as the YouTube channels get bigger, you see them get more sponsors, they become more interesting to viewers. We now know about Tom Daly's knitting that he loves to do and his <laughs> baby and his husband. And like, it really does add. Um, and it just adds more to the sport. More people will tune in now at an event that they might not have otherwise. So. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I think it's I think it's the way that um, the skating needs to go. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw like a Team Two Baritza, um girl, one of the, or a couple of them do channels like this. I think it's the way to bring in sponsors. It's where people are. They're on the internet. You have to meet them where they are. It's, right. Yeah. See, it's a. Uh, it's interesting because think about it. When Greg Louganis was a diver in the '80s, the fact that he was gay was considered to be such a liability. Right. Now you fast forward, Tom Daly being gay is just part of what makes him interesting and being part of his- Well, life. wasn't part of the Greg Luganis thing also, it was like during the AIDS crisis. So yeah, there was like just, so much extra, shows. yeah. But those feelings, even before they knew that he had HIV was like the fact that he was gay. Oh, you know, maybe they won't put him on the Wheaties box or maybe they won't right. give him the Nike endorsement or this endorsement. Right. So, I think you're seeing that, I think uh, Tom Daly is in a J&J &J commercial for you know, something in, in the uh, upcoming games. So I think you're seeing how much things have shifted, but I do think exactly. that them becoming relatable and known personalities is part of what it is, because otherwise someone's just like a random athlete that you see every couple of weeks. I think that's one of the problems with uh, skating is that outside of those of us who follow them all the time, other people don't right. get to them as much. So. Right. Anyway, it's just, yeah, it was a very interesting thing to watch. And then for Simone, she was good, but for a warm up competition, she made mistakes, but she didn't seem to take it. She seemed very relaxed, I thought, last night overall. Especially in the interview, where she was like, yeah, yeah, it wasn't what I wanted, like all of the time, but I feel okay. Yeah. I noticed in the practice, like, she clearly likes her floor team. She seems very happy with the group of girls that she trains with at her gym. And she's really close with the girl. It's probably going to be, I think they're going to be the number one. They're going to be a one-two punch at the Olympics. And it's, it was interesting to start to see it shift a couple months ago because the girl who's number two is named Jordan Childs. And I'll bring this up for everyone because there's a skating connection. And do you remember, I was explaining this to you a little bit last night, is when Tanya Harding was in the 94 Olympics, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was Diane and there was a choreographer with brown hair that was there in this fabulous like sweater. That the gray and looked. white, like winter yes. sweater. Yeah, Puffy. that matched the gray and the black in her hair. Yes, and her name was Erica. She was actually a Romanian gymnast. She wound up coaching this gymnast, Jordan Childs. I think she was her beam coach and like probably floor slash floor choreographer is how it usually goes. Well, she years later gets banned from the ranch, allegedly, for drunk driving with gymnasts in the car, is believed to be the story. It's never, like, this is when they were already in so much hawk about other things that this kind of, like, went under the radar a little bit. We just didn't talk about it that much. And, of course, no one, like, makes the connection of, like, that's Tanya Harding's choreographer. Like, where's that fluffy? Who is showing her and being like, that is that lady? She's the lace lady, yeah. <laughs> she tied her freaking laces, laces in that yeah. moment. And mm -hmm. I don't think anyone in gymnastics cares because they're all like, did you see Simone's vault? The same yeah. way in skating would be like, well, did you watch Yuzu Rahanyu's thesis? Like, that's nice that she right. knew Tanya Harding. Right, right. exactly, she, exactly. She, she, it's like when worlds collide in that level of scale, incredible. So yeah, yeah, that was a that was a tie-in I was not expecting when we were watching last night that there was going to be a connection to Tanya Harding in some way. <laughs> the interesting thing about Simone is if you watch the documentaries, the brain, you know, there's always a parent and there's always an engine behind this. And for Simone, it's her mom who's technically it's her grandfather's second wife. So, but they're adopted okay. from parents. So that so. And her name is Nellie, and she is like the brain behind the business, behind Simone. 
And I remember uh, Flo Gymnastics did this documentary and she's like, we have to write down goals every year to achieve as a family. And we're like, you have to hit your goals. You have to reach them. And she gets Simone going. She's definitely the one that told Simone, I think that you should come back for two events in 2024. Like this is good for this. And Simone now has this number two gymnast. And I, I have a theory that Nellie pulled this girl aside and during the pandemic and was like, you have one year, this is a gift to you. Cause this girl was out of it a year ago. She was like 10, like no one thought, people were like, she's gonna be a good college gymnast, who cares? She came back from this pandemic and has just been dominant. Amazing. But never before, you know, she was a good junior and then she really struggled when she got to the senior. So it's, and I think this Nelly is like mind altering her. Someone described well, her. Being yeah, like, I was also asking you about like how, you know, the skating response to the pandemic, you know, we've seen play out how this was working in gymnastics. And this was the example, right? Like this, this athlete used the pandemic time to sort of just like re-emerge as the super relevant figure. I think that's incredible. The one yeah. thing I think we were seeing last night is they haven't competed in a while. And a lot of them are doing routines that are probably too hard for them to train consistently and do it kind of like men's skating where it's getting to that point where someone can't do that level of difficulty all the, the gymnasts don't compete that much anymore they compete in like they talk about a season simone's going to compete now she'll compete in two weeks at a two-day event she'll compete about two weeks after that at a two-week event and then it's the olympics that's her whole year right is this two-month window of time and then the rest is instagram and training and but they really i mean there are some smaller meets throughout the year, but it's really become hyper condensed because of what their bodies can take. I mean, it's, right. Yeah. It's a little bit of an ugly watch. I mean, it's not enjoyable to see people falling on. Of course not. Yeah. Single event. It's, it's, yeah. But it, it seems it's common between these sports. So, I mean, just as like a quasi segue into yeah. the um, Hanyu thesis, yeah. they kept talking about this sort of like AI approach to gymnastics. Can you tell me how, what that is and do they actually do that? No, it's been discussed by the FIG, which is the equivalent in gymnastics of the ISU that they've invested in technology for AI judging and it's been discussed. And there are things like, Obviously skating is a dark fish for years, but this is this technology is more advanced uh, for it. So like, how would it work for gymnastics? Because like, they don't necessarily deal with things like under rotations and things like they that. They do a right? bit. I mean, okay. when you see girls do beam dismounts and they're not getting the run. I mean, that's where, that's where all these sports are going. Let's be honest. Okay. So okay. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised in diving if we're getting to like, are their legs really together? Are their knees a bit bent? I think all of this stuff is potentially coming, especially as our society becomes more litigious over and over uh, time. And uh, it's possible that it's coming. I think um, I think to ignore the direction or the inevitability of where these sports could go is a mistake, right? I mean, it opens a big question for me because, like, for instance, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of the figure skating fandom shares shares fans with gymnastics, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of figure skating fandom shares fans in like dance and music and things like that too. So this, this sort of AI approach to judging shoves it way over into a technical perfectionist sort of thing. And this discussion about sport versus art and how it's amazing that they can come together that as someone who loves the really artistic side of things, I get panicked because I, I think if now a computer is assessing an entire performance, a computer doesn't know about projection or energy or whatever, you know, um, that part makes me nervous. I understand it must be incredibly frustrating to have inconsistent calls on edges and rotations. I totally get that that must be so irritating. But in the bigger discussion of art and sport, this sort of AI approach is so interesting because then also the way, the way this particular video we saw that summarized Hanyu's thesis sort of made it seem like this was like Hanyu trying to correct his own injustices I got that vibe, but he picked yeah. the flip, and that's not his best 
jump from a pure yeah thing. so i was like how personal is this and then of course in the video they're like he picked the axle which is a great jump for him the loop but he didn't pick the cell he did do it based on the different takeoffs but i was surprised at the flip well and that. then again they show like how other axles are bad and then they show nathan and then they show <laughs> how his is the best and well, this um, wasn't his actual thesis showing right. nathan that was a this is obviously a yeah this is the video summarizing the thesis yeah, yeah. Um, but what's interesting is what makes Hanyu so special. And I think somehow in this obsession about the jumps and the quality of jumps and all this sort of stuff, what many Hanyu fans don't realize is I love Hanyu because he's so artistic. And this well, is- I think his technique is artistic. When you watch yes. quad sour or quad toe or quad loop that Eric triple axel, it is stunningly beautiful. That to I, me he also oh. listens to music. He also hits beautiful positions that, again, transcend a computer assessment. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It's not like I could see like an Elvis Stoiko back in the day or something being like, it needs to be AI and we need to be judging rotation or something as justification because he was only an athlete. But as someone who is an artistic athlete, it surprises me that this was a well, such well, the thing, I, I Look, you don't know how it's going to be employed. And the ISU has done the wrong decision on every thing that has made throughout history that's made me nervous but i did think watching this that maybe it's not bad right like maybe imagine if you could have judged the figures with ai that's Fair. what i was thinking yeah figures with ai would have been incredible but you know the posture and, and all of this and, and things like that there is a point that i do like the judges but he also made a couple political statements that i had to laugh he thinks the jumps are just too complicated to evaluate now, I think the rules around the judges, around the jumps are being too too, too difficult uh, to evaluate. I think he knew that this would be published, people could read this. He also says that he believes that all judges want to judge fairly. I don't believe I've ever met a figure skater in the history of time who would actually believe that, although I think they would feel obligated to say something like that. <laughs> if it was going yeah. to be public and not yeah. wanting to anger objects. I don't know, and certainly his fans don't feel that way. Certainly his fans feel that he's intentionally robbed. So I thought that that was an interesting political statement of someone who feels that this is going to be read. And yeah, I've always gone back day, and... But I did chuckle reading it. I did yeah. chuckle being like, ah. yeah. Right. But it is also one of those things like when we've had split panels back in the day and it would just kind of boil down to, they were, you know, affiliated with the Soviet Union, or these were Eastern Bloc judges that went this way and the Western judges went that way, which is, yes, there's probably some patriotism involved, especially in those decisions, but I also think they're drawn to different aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't surprise me that Jans Hoffman was gonna go for, Jan Hoffman, excuse me, was gonna go for Oksana over Nancy. The thing that that has always impressed me about Jan First of all, we never discussed the other four judges and maybe- I know, it was just because he was the last one that and he just was- because yeah. they were you know, from different countries. But I think the interesting thing there is that most people like Tara Lipinski, her liking Sotnikova makes sense. They're the same kind of skater. Right. Jan went for the skater not like himself. And that always right. impressed me as a really impressive, mature, sophisticated, nuanced person who would go for someone who had a quality that they admired. And I thought that yeah. that was really telling about Jan. And he was consistent in going for Michelle Kwan over Tara four years later. Right. So say what you will about Jan, he at least had a consistent point of view. Yeah. Everyone, when they don't agree with someone, they go, they're so biased. It's a subjective sport. Every single person is biased. Exactly. You have, them. you have a judge that has an educated, biased opinion that's an educated opinion right, right. and then th that's why you have nine of them so that you can yeah. this, right but <laughs> of course he's biased i have a bias you have a bias like 100 percent music i'm biased to whatever right like it's right. just that kind of a thing so uh, um i always thought about it like when i did vocal competitions and there would be a myriad of judges some were other singers some were conductors whatever agents and if there was a baritone on the panel, mm -hmm. and I'm a baritone, it could have gone one of two ways. They're either gonna be more lenient on me because it's the same voice type, so they're gonna have this sort of empathetic approach, 
or they're going to be tougher on me because the standards are higher because that's their voice type. You know what I mean? It's the same kind of thing. I, I, we, we call it that with Tara and Adelina right away. We're like, this is so projection. Like this is, she has to defend Adelina's win because she's defending her own win right now. How about Katarina Bitt? You could look at that. Remember how Katarina Bitt defended Kim Yuna in that video? And I was thinking, you know, Katarina was also a little tentative in her Olympic defense. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a little bit of that there. Yeah, yeah. She was also the performer, the grand dame coming back, but she knows what to appreciate in that. Right, right. So, I loved the clip they were playing of her in this video I, where she's I getting riled her. up in the, yeah, yeah. She was getting a lot of heat on Facebook and our German fans, you know, they've moved off of the Katarina obsession, like Marie 16161 who always messages everything or Andre, you know, they're so Aliona Savchenko focused because right. she was the grand dame of Germany, this Ukraine. Right. Uh, that right. <laughs> but, <laughs> with uh, her French partner. But, uh, you know, uh, what about Katarina? I think Katarina was very passionate about everything being closed down for so long and for her own mental health. And I think she got a little outspoken and then got a lot of backlash, but we kind of mm. missed it. But there was okay. something happening on her Facebook that was very upset. And I thought, Katarina needs to be around the people. She loves she, the, people. she loves the audience. Yeah, they a love performer her. through and through, yeah. She loves to be hiking. We have to give her to the audience, okay? Yes. The people need <laughs> Katarina, all right? Just don't be, so all of these skaters are out in, in public, okay? Yeah. Katarina yeah. needs the audience, okay? The give audience. her a YouTube channel. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh my God, it was just, I just love her so much. It's just, she's just, just all of her imperfections, all of, you know, Michael Shanley loves to point out, like, when we watched, like, the stuff about her and how she lived, and he was like, the East Germans are on bread lines and Katarina's in her BMW. I was like, she gave herself to the public. She earned it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She had, she was like, I had two gold medals and they didn't. <laughs> That's, I did what they told me to do. Mueller. Did you have yeah. to put up with Frau Mueller? No. Exactly, right. exactly, yeah. You don't even know, okay. Right? But then I always think, then there's Annette Putsch. She probably wasn't driving a BMW. She might have been. She might have been, she might have had the trouble or whatever. <laughs> Maybe Linda got a new nose, Annette Putsch got, you know. A new car. <laughs> yes. You don't know. Hmm. So, <clears throat> also, we had some music announcements this week. Jonathan. Hi, Dave. Your favorite skater. <laughs> hold on, hold on. She's not not my favorite skater. Jonathan. Jonathan. What? I, you know, you're talking about real people making a comeback. When KMT was struggling to find her footing and her confidence again, again with Michael, I found her story really inspiring. I really loved her honesty when she was talking about life how she was achieving this great success with Dylan and now she's got to refine her confidence because she's lost it. I found that to be a, a remarkable story. Do I happen to like the material she usually puts out? No. Do I feel that she needs to go back and do any of them again? No, probably not. But that's what is in her heart. So I hope she she has a great success with it. She'd go back to her program from 2020 for the, what they would have done at the Worlds. I loved that program. It had- I know you story, do. It had this. I told her to her face to bring it back. I support you, KMT. I love the program, KMT. You know, I think you should always be skipping. I think it's your best element on the X. And I think people think that that's shady, and I don't. I think it excites me every time she's- It's unique. She's a good skipper, okay? Yeah. <laughs> she looks like skipper in a way. You remember, wasn't know. that Barbie's to sister me, or something? when she does these programs, I can tell she loves skating. Which is ultimately the most important. I want to see joy in someone skating. And if this is the program that brings out her joy, more power to you. I think that's why I like her skip. I think when she skips, I get that this girl loves skating in a way that I love skating, in a way that I see someone else and I'm like, oh, I get it. You know, you, you're you. I, I like it. I think that yeah. this is, I did feel for her. You know, she's selling all of her dresses on Poshmark. And I know she's like headed into her last season. And I thought like, well, every skater needs to make money. It's so expensive and everything. But I thought, oh, it made me sad. I was like, I don't know. I feel like KMT has never gotten the shows that she's deserved. I mean, she's been around a long time. They don't put her on Stars on Ice because yeah. maybe Megan and Eric got that show on Stars on Ice. 
But she has always been a consistently quality skater. I know, but then I thought, like, is she going to need these dresses for when she's a pro? And then I thought, well, maybe she doesn't think she's going to get the shows as a pro. And then that made me sad. And then I was thinking, she, we, we need to give her shows. What is KMT going to do? She should be performing. So yeah, yeah. We need these professional competitions because KMT should do them. As a she kid. would be great at them. Yeah. Yes. Come on, she could do a triple toe. She could do a double axel. Yeah. I don't know. I just it made me sad. KMT. <laughs> Listen, do you ever deep clean your apartment and just like go through like the anxiety that there's a mess? then you sort of feel sad for a brief moment or like nostalgic about random shit. And I'm like, why am I feeling nostalgic about papers that I haven't looked at in five years? Because it's like a, this is your life moment. It is sort of like a revisiting of times in your life of way, I, like I can look at, I have a folder that says old essays and papers. Like I, oh, I have still yes. get them. But, but yeah. like you you relive those moments. You, you're yeah. sort of like, doing your own biography as you go through. Then you feel things. so cleansed when it's gone. Yes. But I was cleaning my apartment because I was moving back in, you know, from spending time with my parents and I was like going through things. And I'm like, I feel very like emotional about yeah. seeing meeting notes from work. Like why do I give a shit? Like I don't Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but you go right back to where you were at that point yes, in time. I that's think. the like point. Where you were emotionally, what was happening, this, what was, and I'm sure the- I was like, there's a lot of life that. that's happened in this apartment. A lot of things. Right? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. It's like a, it's like some edgy play where you're just yeah. like in a spotlight cleaning out your apartment, remembering the life this apartment has seen. Yeah. <laughs> Marie Kondo didn't discuss that when we did it. She was just like, get rid of it. Is it really it going? Yeah. That yeah. was an oversimplified version, okay? She didn't acknowledge her emotions. Yeah. Why did she ever get a season two? Because I think we saw what it was and now we got it. Excuse me. <laughs> How many times are we gonna watch the Queer Eye guys visit a fat person and tell them that they should take care of themselves and dress well? Or a guy who like doesn't comb his hair? I mean, how many different times? How many times are you gonna watch like Jonathan Van Ness with stringy hair and being like, yes, queen. Okay. That's how many times I'm going to watch that. But wait, Dave, how many Dave times have you watched the Great Pottery Throwdown now? It was good, right? It was okay. <gasps> Dave, like a knife through my heart. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't invested. I was too tired. So I wasn't Fair enough. Fair enough. No. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. There was a lot happening. Listen, yeah. Simone was competing. All right. Can I be honest? I don't like Simone's floor routines. And I think that her, and they said that her Dancing with the Stars partner was gonna choreograph this. And someone's like, are you excited? I'm like, no, her floor routines all look the same. It now has like added almost cheerleader vibes to it at one point. I don't know like what is happening. I never understood uh, the choreographic moments they in do... gymnastics in general. Listen. Listen. The beam, the beam in particular, it just confuses me. It doesn't seem to the add anything. Choreography, when done well, is fabulous. Okay. Let me tell you. When you see I'll have to see the right. lower her arm, even though she's problematic, or do a little swivel where she kicks her leg front, turns and kicks. You are like, oh, good God. That is okay. beautiful, okay? Most people, I don't know why you're on your head turning and doing and you think this looks pretty or Chelsea. This is an yeah. ironic love, but Chelsea's like owned it, okay? Okay. A okay. lot of them, it's like either or, but that comment is, what are they doing on the beat? Why aren't they doing that? People yeah, like, kind of, especially because there's no music or overarching like feeling I necessarily get from a beat. And then always so distracting because you usually hear someone else's floor music in the background. Oh my God, I used to, so I was on a diving team in the summer. We would dive for like six weeks out of the year, right? But we loved okay. it and would dive all summer at the dive. Like that's what I like to do at the swim club. I was always in my town's like swim and dive team, right? And I think for a lot of us, our parents worked. So we would hang out at the swim club like all day, every day. And, um, and I had those VHS tapes of like the 96 Olympics that I taped. I mean, I used to, I used to imitate everyone's approaches about the way. Or <laughs> Cynthia Potter talking about the Chinese crow hop, about mm -hmm. how when they're going backwards on the board and they're really double bouncing, it's a crow hop. That is a crow hop. <laughs> and she is the most anal OCD commentator of all time. 
Okay. I imagine everyone in diving hates her, but as a viewer, <laughs> I love her because I learned so much. Ex which is the point of the commentator. And movie. I think she's so hilarious that like okay. over time you can rewatch her stuff and learn something. Okay. You know, he's sliding past vertical, Jonathan, on that land on that entry. He is sliding past vertical, and there was too much splash. That's not going to get nine and a half and ten. And she's what she's what teaches us how to engage when we watch them. Otherwise, like we're just watching a series no, of dice. And all no, the soccer mom at home is going. She is too critical, and they are too mean to those divers. Oh, mean. No, see, I feel like now I'm learning how to appreciate fine diving because yeah. we read those okay. comments every day. She is. Mm -hmm. She's. Mm -hmm. She's. Mm -hmm. she's Crow hop, that is a racist term. And that is, um, oh. <laughs> I'm sure they can't say it anymore. I don't know, that was like a term in 90s. I'm sure that's not allowed. I don't know, yeah. like, I'm okay. sure there's a connotation and that is not allowed, all right? Mm -hmm. That used to be a big term. She used to, yeah, just drink that my water. Stoughton, she used to describe him like this like warrior who was like injured and put back together with tapes and glue, who was like from Rocky. <laughs> He looked 110 in 1996. What is Dimitri Salton doing now? Does anyone know? How is okay. <laughs> How is Okay. I don't know. You, you don't even know. Jonathan the Divers, Fu Ming Sha was my favorite from China. Okay. I've always enjoyed watching diving. Yeah. I get that from you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. gymnastics with the beam choreography and the bad music and the, that's, and that's a tough very, one. Very upsetting to you. I, this top knot bun is upsetting to everyone. Yeah. Well, them. you know why it looked, um, it was distracting. It took me, it took my eye up and out of sort of the amazing thing they were doing. So it's not like everyone has to look so incredible, but I would love for nothing to take me out of what I'm trying to enjoy. So speaking of, you know, like perfectionist, like tight personalities, like how we discuss MJM, the gauge girls are the MJM of gymnastics, only they have like the beautiful poses, but they are mm. so freaking rigid. And the choreographer only has one style of movement that she gives every single person for the last 20 years. Okay. It's amazing to me how he has so much talented technique, talented um, girls, talented like aesthetic perspective point of view, and yet they mess it up every time. They mess mm. it up every time and like, He's the one that's had two gymnasts pass away. He wears the gloves. He has a wife who claims that right. she's the best gymnast in the Soviet Union, but they didn't put her on the team because she was Armenian. I don't believe that. Uh, there are okay. videos of her <laughs> on YouTube from the 80s. The whole thing is fun. And okay. there's a very MJM Tomsy vibe to that gym. Okay. And I love it all, okay? Yeah, yeah. There's something about the fact that you kind of know that they're always going to be in the mix and never achieve. Like you just kind of know. Yeah, because of that tightness. They can't get out of their own way in the tightness. Yeah, that is such a skating. They have the most beautiful yeah. body line on bars, but you actually need to be a little imperfect to swing and they can never get the swing. Mm. It's interesting. It's yeah. Just one of those things. Yikes. We also heard that Vincent's bringing back his program. Well, it's the Beijing Olympics. He's doing Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Which is a beautiful soundtrack. Yes. The yeah. one thing is, on ice perspectives made him look like an incredible skater. I mean, someone was pointing this out the other day. They're like, we need him to follow us around all the time because he can make anyone look more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He made Vincent look like he had the deepest edges I have ever seen in my life. Listen, he's got a good spread eagle and he knew how to, how to frame it from the- Maximize right. it, yeah, exactly. So and he make, tied it in in that announcement with a lot of Asian heritage sort of commentary and well, of course, important time. Uh, and not remember the New York Times article about Nathan doing Mao's Last Dancer and how he took ballet as a fetus and how yeah. they were taking this whole thing tied in. That yeah. will come back. What is Nathan gonna skate to? And will there be like another long? The media will eat it up. But didn't Lori Nickel do it last time? And then now she's just giving Vincent this narrative because the Olympics are in China. Listen, NBC loved it. When the last time the Olympics were in China, it was all about the fact that Sean Johnson had a Chinese coach. So she put Chinese letters on her leotard. These people yeah. know what they're doing. They're giving yeah. it to you because they know you're going to sit there and be like, oh, he's Chinese American. He's skating to something about a tiger. We're in China. It's interesting. The first time I really sort of realized this was when a lot of the Russian coaches would do that. Like Marina made sure that Meryl and Charlie were doing Scheherazade for Sochi. Yes. Or when we were talking about Elena and she was saying that Tamara was trying to push French music 
on mm -hmm. them for Albertville until she let them do Nutcracker instead. But it's an interesting uh, concept. Dating coaches have a more sophisticated view of this because when the Romanian gymnasts would come to America, every time they would pick Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> there was something called Hooked on America that Lavinia Milosevic did. I don't know what it is. But it had da 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 Okay. As if, as if we're identifying, we're like Yankee Doodle. That is Yankee our Doodle. music. I love that this is. girl. Yes, yeah, I love the old dude. Yeah, <laughs> it is our heritage. Well, yeah. other countries, they have folk songs that they right. do love. That do have those kind of connotations. We don't necessarily. No, we're like way. Bruce Springsteen. It'll kill yeah. in Jersey. You know, we're like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. Know. Oh my God! Could you imagine? If like they if they held the world championships at the Meadowlands, it would be like the Romanian floor teams would be Bon Jovi, <laughs> Whitney, amazing, Bruce, yeah, yeah, really lovely, really lovely stuff. <laughs> Jeff Leppard, I don't know, it would be great. Okay, I just, and you know what? You're right. It would get the crowd going. We get the crowd nuts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. Hooked on America didn't do it for me, but I appreciated the pandering and the effort. <laughs> Kind of like, do you remember when Hillary Clinton got in, got in trouble for like the not my abuela when she tried to like they called it hispandering? We well, you know when politicians <laughs> really pander. I like, didn't hear that term, but that's a pretty funny term. Okay. Yeah. Hillary yeah. used to love to say the term like she used to mm -hmm. love it. Okay, and okay. it sounded so natural. Yeah, or perhaps not. Perhaps not. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It would be like if we were going to say homage all the time, Hrom. you know, which you do usually. And then like one time a K sound comes in. They hear like, it. The, yeah. Roughly. They are. They're ready. They are so ready. <laughs> oh, speaking of like scandalous Russians, you know, Anna Cantu and the, the Mexicanos, they had all of the freak out that Danny G was maybe upset. And oh, she's coming to New Jersey. Oh my, I think we should take a picture together. Sports are you will love it. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Of the yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's supposed to come to New Jersey and bring her students to Galena for a week in July. Lovely. It needs to happen. So, yeah, I think so too. Yes, I think it's. Um, You'll make the cover of every tabloid. <laughs> could you imagine? We'd have to do something like we'd have to plan it. I don't know. Yeah, that, remember that's what Kathy Griffin taught us. She was like, the way to get like publicity has got to be in the picture with someone else. And now you're doubling your opportunity that they're going to use it. So you just get a couple of hot topics all together in one photo and you are good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You talk about the king. Yeah. <laughs> Cell phones. Also this week, there was a fan, uh, a skating fan who is a therapist, who is, I think, a, a oh, researcher, right. who did an interview with Mirai, and they're also going to do an event with Gracie Gold about mental health and skating. And I think the idea is really great. Um, I think there's more to probe. I have questions. Write to me. I have things to really ask because... Yeah, yeah because uh, the, the clip I was watching was interesting. It was... I'll put <clears> the link <throat> in the description of, uh, of Tom Daly's really videos. I'll put it of Mirai. Uh, in the Hanyu's thesis, so. And, and maybe a Yankee Doodle Dandy clip, if you feel Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, don't worry. Okay, thank don't you. Don't worry, thank you. okay. But it was interesting to hear Mirai, um, sort of for me as an outsider who thinks mental health is outrageously important, mm -hmm. uh, that there was a difference between her seeing a sports psychologist and a separate personal therapist. Mm -hmm. That, to me, I thought maybe like, a sports psychologist would get into sort of personal therapy things because of course to me that they would be so intertwined but she was saying how important it was for her to do the two sort of separate things um which i didn't realize that perhaps sports psychology as she was experiencing it was so tunnel visioned about competing mm. i found that kind of 
I think missing a lot the- of it is. I think it depends what your focus is and what you who your therapist is. Because obviously, I've gone to different therapists and had widely different experiences every single right. time. And there were different times in my life where I was more open than others about yeah. discussing something. And you never know if that's your relationship with the person, the question they ask, the, how honest you're going to be. Yeah. When I first saw a therapist, he asked me if I was gay and I said, no. And then they put me on anti-anxiety medication and three months later I said, yes. So, mm. and then okay. my dad's insurance changed right at the time that I was coming out. And he like left a message on the answer machine. Like, I don't know if this is a good time for him to be switching therapy. It was very uncomfortable. My parents didn't know at the time. Yeah, so she- that's kind of an overstep there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, he was also a straight guy. And I don't think that he had a lot of experience dealing with someone like coming out. In the- mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. There was a lot about that situation. He was the only time that I've seen that I'd seen someone from medication who also did therapy and I never did that again. And yeah, maybe that was right. Maybe he wasn't as experienced in those eras. Okay. Those yeah. Cause the, most people I know see two separate people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but, I had never seen anyone before. And he was like, oh, I'll do both. And I was like, oh, great, why not? You know, when like, also like, is this someone like, because I, I think what you're saying is true. Like when I first started mm-hmm. going, I had to have someone that I wasn't going to hold anything back with. I had to feel comfortable enough to like put it all out on the table without judgment. And for someone like an athlete like Mariah, who knows where that sports psychologist is from or connected to? Like, is that some sort of like, in-house sports psychologist where somehow you feel you can't be open because you have to say, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I think that the person cannot be anyone connected. See, this is the thing is that I've heard about coaches talking to someone sports psychologist and maybe that works for some skaters and doesn't, but I would want someone separate. I think the also thing is, the weird thing is it's hard to find a quality sports psychologist who knows your sport enough on a specific way that can help you while also not being a quack, right? Like you run into right. the master problem. But, right. you know, I'm listening to a book about sports psychology right now, but it's really geared to triathletes. But, you know, there okay. can apply to any sport and you make connections, but you, but you have to be reflective and smart about it, right? And there are some athletes that aren't going to take figure skating that seriously. And if someone doesn't take figure skating as a serious sport, or they think it's, or they have their own preconceived bias, or they think everyone's just amazing, and they don't learn about it enough, they're never going to be able to help you about it enough. Although that- there's a part of me that wonders if like, sort of like, self love and self care and like knowing that like, your worth as a person is not defined by whatever your result is, regardless of the sport. I don't know if some of that sort that of like regular therapist, but that it yeah. depends, right? Like there yeah. are some people, there are some sports psychologists that have a theory that it's always about the parent or the coach, right? right. Or, but I think to, to really address these issues, I, but I was thinking, listening to this, that and listening to Paulina's podcast and listening to some of the skaters give interviews who haven't had tons of time of reflection, but all have similar themes. I think for someone that becomes so focused in one area of their life and probably really for everyone, I think that probably every teenager probably needs a therapist as they're growing up just in today's society. Just, uh, I believe that you should treat your mental health the way you treat your physical health. And I think that that's just something that, I think we're gonna learn much more about this in the coming right. years, right. especially with pressures and things like that, that happen and Instagram and all of these things. I just think that it's so common. But I think especially if you're going to be on Team USA, I think each person needs um, a uh, a mental health uh, professional and a sports psychologist. Well, and you know what? It's like now as an educator, I think it's just as important for the coach to be going. Because I think we see like a coach can set a tone. We have seen, for instance, like a coach like Tracy Wilson, whatever magic she possesses and her approach and handling of Jason, like when at the- um, And they both see, uh, my understanding is they both do see like a performance coach or counselor or someone. And well, Stephanie then it's Kemmer working. Worked with Marie France and the skaters, or I don't know if she worked with them concurrently, but she has worked with Marie France, I think as a coach and an athlete. 
and has worked with their athletes. Even as you're talking about with like gymnastics, where like some of the some of the schools get tight, like I think that's an energy that's thrown out there. So it was the most amazing thing at that Detroit Nationals to see Jason having a rough warm up, go over to Tracy. They shared whatever moment it was. And he sort of reset and was able to like pivot and take command of the the warm up and then do a lovely program after that. Like, and I think as a coach, it's probably just as important to know your angle in helping a skater in that moment. Yeah, I was listening to this book about, and I think the most important things that I got of it so far, um, they talked about setting goals that you are 70 to 80% likely to hit. That way you have something to strive for, but that's possible. And I think that we okay. talk about athletes that seem delusional off the time that set goals that aren't, right? And about how that can be problematic. Like I asked someone in C Live about, oh, are you gonna do triple toe, triple toe, or triple lutz, triple toe? And they said, why not a quad triple? And I was like, but I don't, in my head, I'm like, I don't Optimize know. Optimize your chance for success. So like, you're not always that's failing at triple. That's possible, right? And I, right. Think, right. I think having something to strive for is great, but what is 70 to 80% possible? They also talked about training people that are maybe 70, like you're 70 to 80% of their level and that people are like a little bit below and a little bit above and having that mix, but not wildly above. So like me skating with Nathan Chen is not super beneficial because right. I'm never gonna feel, I might feel insecure that I might not measure up to him. And I do get that because there are some sessions that I'm on where I'm on sessions with kids that are doing triples and yeah, if I'm having a bad day, I'm gonna be like, what do I, what am I doing here? Like they're all doing like amazing things and I'm trying to get this counter, right? Right, but right. on days that things are going well, that doesn't bother me at all. I don't even like right. really of course. notice, yeah. right? But on the days when it's not going well, you, I, you do feel, and they said that you feel more inspired by watching someone or that, you know, study show that is closer to your ability to achieve something and work hard and do it and that that is more inspiring and like more likely to bring in a positive habit. So I thought that that was interesting. It, it applies to music all the time because there were performances that when I would see someone that was almost within reach mm -hmm. and then there's a, there's a huge like positive inspiring moment where you're like, wait, I kind of want to go practice right now because I, I think <laughs> I, I could do that. But then also there's this like other lofty ideal where you would go see something and you're like, I don't even know why I'm trying. I, I like the gap is so big. Why? How, how is this ever possible? That's why it was yeah. so key. I think that Marilyn and Charlie trained with Tessa and Scott, and then Tessa and Scott did train with the French, even though Papa doesn't scissor on, even though it was obviously uncomfortable when you share a coach. For them to have a team that's so close in ability, and there are so few teams at that level that are that right. close in ability that are going to inspire you in that way, I think right. that's the true power. I mean, yeah. who knows if as much as it's, you know, good coaching and things like that, I think having them together is such a part of the magic. And I think that's why we right. saw the Caroli Ranch system work as well as it does. Like, it's not even them at a certain point. If you have a good enough coach and you have enough talent together. They this is both. that they're just in, in the same proximity. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. It's interesting, like watching the kids and, you know, your own sessions where there are kids that are all at a, near a certain level and motivating each other. And you do see kind of that output. And when there's like a positive energy, you can kind of feel it on the ice yeah. when they're motivating each well, other. Well, how many times have we seen like warm up set the stage for one of like the most iconic competitions of all time? Or you just know the air is wrong in that yes. warm up and everybody starts like absorbing everyone else's like weird energy and suddenly it's like the twilight zone out there. Well, yeah. That's just how mental these sports are, right? right. So that's why I right. think, I kind of was listening to different podcasts and it, it, it's not a criticism on any each athlete, but so many athletes really haven't had that person ask them what they want to do after they graduate. And they each think that like there should be someone to help them. And I do think it, and I could see how a federation is like, well, we're here to responsible for your skating. Like, what, what, that's not our job. Like, do you have parents? But at the same time, the parents are so invested. I think maybe that's where a mental health professional comes in and starts to ask someone about outside interests because it talked about burnout leading, like when you're too singular focused and you don't have anything else that was in the book. And then it also talked about just the gratitude list, which is in any substance abuse program or anything about someone 
listing things that they're grateful for in that act actually helps your sports performance because you're thinking you're looking for more positive aspects to get out of things or a hard training instead of just folk channeling negative. right exactly it's just interesting yeah. that, like these things are so connected so yeah i thought that that was beneficial and yeah that was what's the what's the book called the, the one about the triathlete I have to look it up. i'm listening to it on audible as i go it's like yeah know, it sounds it sounds brave, incredible it's called the brave athlete calm the f down <laughs> I love that actually. Yeah. And it is by. Uh, there's like an end rise to something. Uh, end rise to the occasion. It's by Simon Marshall and Leslie Patterson. So it's okay. uh, decent. I think there, there were some uh, things to get out of it. So I, I, uh, take what you like and leave the rest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and then on sad news, Heavy Scott Fold is in hospice. So, yeah. um, that was posted by Paul Wiley in a group to I think the skaters that had worked with him. And we saw that um, this week. So it's just interesting. I was doing like a Google search about him a little while ago, because I think Jenny and I were talking about it. And I wanted to see what I could find about Evie Scottfold on newspapers.com. I think one thing we never knew is that his sisters, he had twin sisters who were older and they were like celebrities in the ice follies. Didn't, I wondered if Scott talked about that in his book for a second when he mentioned no, he that. Did. Okay, okay. So he Fascinating. Has, his two sisters, Joanne and Joyce, I'm not sure if they're still alive or not. I think they are. But even if you if you Google the Scott Bold twins, uh, you'll find pictures of them. And Evie was a show skater. And I don't know Jenny had talked about that when they would go through security, Evie has a metal plate in his head. Evie has a metal plate in his head because he did a backflip on tour for the ice follies that went spectacularly wrong. And that's what ended his show career. Oh my God. And he, um, he, uh, yeah, so he was, he wanted to be like a, I think like a comic kind of performer in the ice show. And he Isn't joined- that interesting because like we know 17. him so intense. Yeah. <laughs> he joined the ice show at like 17. I think they had an intense father. Um, but the sisters were like on Christmas cards and stuff. Like they were quasi celebrities. Like the, when wow. The, and you know okay. that Eddie Shipstead in um, Colorado, I think just like pole harness and jumps. He's from like a family that like ran the ice shows of like generations of performers. Okay. And then the other thing is, so Mary Scottfold, who's married to uh, Evie, who has a twin sister, Anne, and everyone always used to, because they have like the gravelly smoker voices and they're very autistic and everyone kind of yeah. love them. If you read the articles about them, it sounds like their father got mad at the judges and made them quit skating. And it's like written about an article so you could tell that that was some sort of a tale back in the day. That was, okay. Okay. they were like the promising up and coming free skaters and some sort of a situation happened. But fascinating. This is all like that Gus, Lucy lineage and- right. Mary's in those Gus Lucy videos because she's bringing Paul because she's like passing down the lineage and that's why he was chosen. If you've ever watched like Gus Lucy sit in the couch and be like, oh, are you supposed to enter a sit span? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, sounds like Mary too. <laughs> okay. That's I think about Evie in the tan coat being a grizzly bear. I mean, this was yeah. iconic in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, they were so, they were so inundated. Like um, between 92 and 94, it was like that they were it. Like it was Think nonstop. About it. That, any fluff piece, any of those documentaries that came out in 2014 about Tanya and Nancy, the Scott Folds were some of the highlights. Hearing about Evie throwing a, a lamp across the room in the hotel when they lost. Evie knew it was Tanya Harding from immediately. Mary and her designer scarf looking very skating, being like, how do you know it was Tanya? Like, <laughs> yeah. Mary being like, well, Nancy, she grew out her hair and she became very autistic. You know, like as she was, <laughs> they are stars, Jonathan. Yeah, One exactly. Them, they are like old friends in our head, never met them in our lives. It's true, it's true, yeah. And they so gave they, us Jenny. They gave they Jenny gave, that Lutz. Yeah. They gave us that quote in Christine Brennan's book that Evie knew 
Nancy's chances based on the size of Tanya's ass. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 if it was tight, she had been training. They didn't have a chance. But yes. And if it wasn't, she wasn't training. Nancy could win. Yeah. Yes. That was an actual quote. Yeah. Inside Edge in the description box. Okay. <laughs> Page 150. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not recommended enough. Okay. 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 This is where the sport comes from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just love anyone that would be so free to say things like that. That just right, right. That's the thing they felt okay to share. So, what was the thing they did not feel okay to share? That's and in Scott Hamilton's book, he has many Evie stories that are very uh, revealing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting perfect, character for fascinating sure. Fascinating person. You know. Yeah, very much so. An icon <laughs> you know, in the sport. Wonder about like what was Evie's dad like? I don't know, Evie. It's all about from whence you've come. You know? you know, there's that story. I listened to an interview where Evie didn't show up to Paul Wiley's practice at the Olympics because he's like, I've been there for you at every practice and you haven't delivered. So it's time you toughen up on your own. And he did. And then like there was time that he would go to practice and read the newspaper until his athletes like gave him something worth saying. worth watching. <laughs> Speaking of sports psychology. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, any Scott Bold story is fantastic, okay? True. These are just, how about the fact there's that fluff piece about Nicole Bobek and when, um, and he, and I guess she, they taught her for a couple of months and Abby was just like, she needs to get to the rank. <laughs> yeah, that's how we can train her, <laughs> she, she shows, yeah. But my other favorite quote about Abby when he's talking about Nancy, he's like, if she's happy, you're gonna know it. If she's not happy, you're gonna know it. <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously the same could have been said about Evie. <laughs> he seems like our uncle at any Thanksgiving that- Yeah. Come Outrageous, on. you don't know what's coming next, but you know you're here for it, yeah. Jenny always tells stories about him that he has like, so Evie was a ginger, or is a ginger, right? Uh, or was a ginger when he had hair, the natural color, right? Right. And, white. and he had like, ton of daughters like all daughters and he made one daughter either eat her broccoli or her brussels sprouts like and he wouldn't let her get up to the table until she finished it and she ate it and then she vomited it all over him and jenny really appreciated that story as a former yeah th this is the kind of stock that they're creating yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> wow okay yes there it is but un unfortunate and obviously my heart goes out to mary know, too but it's I think we have to celebrate what he has given our skating fandom. I mean, yes, some which of is the much. Quotes, some yeah. of this, the most fabulous like, <laughs> stories. He shaped a generation of skating, no question about it. Mary and her sunglasses. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, my favorite is when she, when she and Nancy are in the kiss and cry. See, I want to do a, I've always wanted to do like a, um, like a montage of Nancy's greatest moments in my mind of like mm -hmm. my, cause I love all sides of Nancy. Okay. I love happy Nancy. I love pissed off Nancy. Disney love, world Nancy. Yeah. Yes, okay. because when she's happy, you're going to know it. When she's not happy, you're going to know it. And I find her like a reality show, like so entertaining, right? Yeah. But Mary and Evie are a big part of that. And they're why I love um, microphones in the Kiss and Cry because they become personalities and Raphael yes. needs more coverage on him. Yes. Because he helps engage the viewer. But even when we went back to the 80s and mm -hmm. who was your girl that, that worked with them in the 1980s? Sandy Lenz. Sandy Lenz. Like there were some good moments in those Kiss and Cry moments with Sandy Lenz and the Scott Wolves. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> First of all, you've kept Nancy and Abby laughing at her camel spin and her free skate at the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And then you have Mary be like, I had that dream. I had that dream, you skated perfectly. And then she was like, oh, I hope you get that six. And they see the marks come up and Nancy goes, no, nope, never. Yeah. Good stuff. It's good Think stuff. about Galena and Victor when he gets the six from the Romanian judge and, they, and they're like. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, like <laughs> back in, yeah. in 94, rewatch it. It's great. Okay. The two okay. Of, okay. This is why you need the if only the, ki the, the kiss and cry footage, footage. Yeah. saying in that kiss and cry. Okay. Right. You, they needed to invest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can still hear Galena screaming, Nancy second, Nancy second. Yeah. She's a competitive woman. All right. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Did I tell you that she called me after my first lesson with Nina? So Nina, so Danny G had said that quote. Right. About to people about how, which, which Michelle Contu, not Anna, sent to me. And apparently they like were having a tiff and not speaking about how I have more energy. Like, I think it's like, I have more energy sleeping than you did in that spin, right? Which everyone I know who's ever been coached by a Russian thinks is hilarious because right. it's just every day, right? Right, okay. So Nina was saying that to me like, as we were working on my camel spin, okay? Yeah, <laughs> right? okay, okay. And um, and I said it to Galina and she was like, Div, I am very soft and white compared to my daughter. Angel coach, angel. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so let that sink in, yeah. <laughs> yes. So yes, I mean, there's lots going on. So yeah, I think, the Terry girls have been on vacation for like a couple of weeks. Yeah. There was that one clip of them working with Dudikov and the harness. No news. Pyramid, the pyramid is closed for maintenance at the moment. It's on it's coming back. Yeah, it's coming back when there's something to report. Yeah. There's course. nothing to report on it right now. Exactly. It will come back. Don't mm -hmm. worry. Okay. Fear not. <laughs> People might be sleeping, but they're not dead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I really think we need at the Olympics, I would like, some people debate, you know, did they show the Carolis too much? But you know what? They engage the viewer in every broadcast. They might yeah. have gone too far with it in terms of the mythologizing of, mythologizing of them. Mm. But like those, to hear Frank and the kiss and cry talking to Michelle and the Scott Folds, like these are personalities you need to listen when to. When it's real, like we've heard some coaches like Tom C or something prepare his remarks, you know, so that they were caught on camera. But I, I think in general, we get some very real moments. And certainly in the Russian coverage, they know the importance of that because they show the coaches during the entire program, or at least during and the jumping you hear them, They have the microphones and the kiss and exactly. cry. Exactly. Exactly. And when the Terry and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need it on Raphael. Hundred percent. Yeah, that is going to keep on giving for the Olympics. Okay, if Charles Schultz has like a grandson that wants to draw, they will make Snoopy into training <laughs> coach modeled on Raphael, the way he was modeled on Carlo Fossi. Okay, amazing. That exactly. is, I'm telling you, that is a show. Also, Marie France, they could yes. have they could have a peanut yes. with like wavy angled hair and a designer <laughs> coat. And yeah, yeah, very France. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is the kind of things we need to work. Amazing. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. Hold it edge and look sexy, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>